After a third season that was almost unanimously agreed upon as pretty good, showrunner and co-creator David Greenwalt stepped away from the project and the writing team on Angel were keen to make the season more ambitious than any before it. Something to keep the viewer guessing on the edge of their seat, completely unaware of who was around the corner and what they would bring with them into the story. Does it pay off? Fuck no. But well, here and there, but the drawbacks are certainly the most notable things to mention when talking about this season. The first big sign of something wrong was with the development. David Simkins was appointed as the new showrunner, a name that no Buffy fans are familiar with as he was a complete newcomer to the show and unsurprisingly parted ways with the show after only three months in charge, before any episodes could even be produced. As a result, Jeffrey Bell was made showrunner after making his name known by being a big presence in last season's direction. Notable writer Tim Minear, who would have been my pick for showrunner, joined the rating team for Joss Whedon's Firefly, a bigger show and a bigger network, and as we all know that doesn't last long. Let's get into this monster of a season, as this is an episodic analysis of Season 4 of Angel. Stephen S. Tonight is a name that many of you may recognise from being involved with Buffy's fifth and sixth seasons. Now, for some reason, I speculate because he wrote one of the most infamous episodes of that show, he swapped shows and for the final two seasons of Angel was heavily involved with the story planning and writing. We open with a dream sequence where the entire team, including Wesley, are sitting around a table having a meal until things take a turn for the hungry and of course, in case you've forgotten, Angel is still under the sea for what we can assume to be around three months. Back on dry land, Gunn and Fred have been picking up the slack while Angel and Cordy are MIA, spending the rest of their time looking after Connor, who is staying with them at the hotel and Gunn and Fred have taken on a temporary parental role for him, completely oblivious that he is the reason why Angel is still missing. Hell, Gunn and Fred don't even know that Holtz is dead, that's how far behind they are. Lorne is still in Las Vegas and the team haven't been able to get in contact with him very frequently due to his many shows, we presume. As they chase down another lead, Wesley and Lila are still getting it on and Lila asks Wes if he knows anything about what Angel is or what happened to him. Wesley lies and tells Lila that that part of his life is over and he couldn't care less. She leaves and he reveals a chained up Justina in his closet who he forces to take him to where Angel is, since he reckoned she had something to do with it and she admitted what she and Connor had done. The team tracks down that lead I mentioned earlier, a vampire, but since Connor doesn't want Gunn and Fred to find Angel, he stakes the vampire that may lead them to where Angel is and makes it look like it attacked him. Fred gets a hold of Lauren, who doesn't have much in the way of help to offer. Ah, uh, that's my cue. Take care of yourself and, um, and make sure Fluffy's getting enough love. Do you have anything? Yeah. And who's Fluffy? Wesley finds Angel and heals him using his own blood since it's stronger than an animal's... Okay. He heads for the hotel, leaving Justine tied to a post at the dock, telling her to change her ways or this line of work will kill her. We can assume she does so as this is Justine's final appearance. At Wolfram and Hart, Linwood informs Lila that they know about her relationship with Wesley and she shrugs it off, claiming it to be personal rather than business. She responds by going to the senior partners about Linwood's failure with Angel and she decapitates him, taking over as leader of the special projects branch. Wesley calls and updates the rest of the team on what happened to Angel and that Connor is responsible and Fred goes a little overboard with the taser. Wes brings him back and promptly leaves and when Connor attempts to escape, Angel springs to his feet and confronts Connor sternly, saying that after all he's done, he still loves him. I love you, Connor. Now get out of my house. Angel collapses again and insists that the team must now focus their efforts on finding Cordelia, who, meanwhile... God, I am so bored. Cordelia is still a higher being, which basically involves standing around doing nothing whilst watching the world turn, hence her boredom. And as a season opener, it breaks the norm for Angel, and that's making it entirely plot heavy. Usually, Angel opens its seasons with a formulaic-like episode, easing people in, and while the next few episodes certainly do that, this is an odd and frankly new thing for the show to do. Also having a season opener be written by someone who's never written these characters before is another odd choice. That being said, this episode is fine. I noted that the show feels much more colder here, like maybe season one colder points without much daft plot lines or quippy bickerings besides Gunn and Fred. He's lost the mission, bro. Well, we're about to lose this whole place, and you know you can't say bro. We will, as soon as we find Marissa. Can I say dog? They meet Wesley for the first time in a while, who doesn't feel like staying around where he was told he wasn't welcome, and leaves before they can engage in any proper conversation. Connor decides to stay with Gunn and Fred, bullshitting them that he wanted to get his father back just as much as they did, while sabotaging every lead they could find. <laughs> Angel kicks him out so that he can find out what it's like to live in this world without family, or something. Punishment? This kid grew up in a hell dimension, it's not like surviving without nothing is going to be a challenge for him. Linwood is a character who also makes his final appearance as Lila goes behind his back, heading into the post she was always dreaming of, head of special projects. Now she is in charge, what will she be doing to Angel? And what will she make of Wesley lying to her? To be honest, she was probably expecting it. Not a bad start. Now let's get to finding Cordelia. 
Mir Smith is a writer who has always enjoyed her case-like episodes, where the story centres on a character who we've never seen before while the team develops around that. And this episode is no different, as we're introduced to Gwen, a woman with unnatural electric abilities in her hands who can very easily kill anyone she touches, hence the gloves. She's a thief and is commissioned by a collector named Elliot to steal a valuable artefact, the Axis of Pythia from a museum. The team, meanwhile, are packing up Cordelia's things from her place to take back to the hotel in hopes of finding something amongst her stuff that might give them an idea what happened to her. Phantom Dennis isn't happy and tries to put things back to the way they were. Ugh, damn it, Dennis, she's not coming back. Damn alright, Fred. Well, that's one way to end Dennis's character, have him being screamed at. And yes, goodbye, Phantom Dennis, we hardly knew you. Or saw you. Angel goes to Wesley, who's heading his own team of demon fighters, and Angel tries to explain that he forgives Wesley for what he did, having been given all the time in the world to think about it under the sea, explaining why he was in that dream sequence at the table. West doesn't forgive Angel or the team for what they did to him in retaliation, though, and instead gives Angel what he came for, and that's everything he has on Cordelia. He's come to the correct conclusion that Cordy is in another planar dimension, but not dead. Dinza is who he needs to speak to, and she only speaks to the dead, so Angel contacts her in the sewers, and wouldn't you know it, all the answers he seeks are in that same artifact that Gwen is to steal. So they both plan their own individual heists, unaware of the other, and bump into one another midway. Gwen escapes with the axis, but Gunn tries to stop her getting electrocuted in the process, killing him. Gwen gives him another shock similar to the Fribulator, which brings him back just in time for them all to get out of there. Wes and Lila are still in their relationship, and Lila is now aware that Wes lied to her, which she doesn't seem that bothered by, almost like she was expecting it. She intends to make contact with Connor in some way to start a plan where they employ him, however, when she prepares to do so, Angel shows up and offers to pretend he forgot what he caught her doing if she finds out the name of this mysterious electric woman who stole the axis. He also smells Wes's scent all over her, so the cat's out of the bag on that one, guys. Fred is upset that Gunn acts like dying was nothing and she's been carrying so much responsibility since Angel's disappearance in order to keep up business. Angel confronts Gwen, presumably given her location by W and H, and the two fight, resulting in her electrocuting Angel's heart to beat again, which causes a random burst of passion to come out of him, kissing her passionately. I assume this has something to do with the fact that I think the last time this happened he was with Buffy, if I'm not mistaken, and I will remember you? They're suddenly trapped in an elevator when Elliot appears and decides to kill them both, taking the axes for himself without paying her, simply because he deemed Gwen too unprofessional to do the job discreetly. They easily escape, and Gwen, now with no reason to have the axes, gives it to Angel, who uses it to learn that Cordelia is now a higher being. He seems content with this, and that she's in a place of joy. What are you, deficient? Get me out of here! Angel focuses his efforts on finding Cordelia now that he's back, which he achieves by the end of the episode. Cordelia doesn't want to be a higher being anymore, and since she can watch everything they're doing, is pretty peeved that they're suddenly deciding not to do anything about it. Lila attempts to reach out to Connor, but is prevented from doing so by Angel, and she just gives up after this. Angel learns about her and Wes, although it doesn't seem too phased by it. He probably smelled her all over Wes earlier in the episode. Wesley rejects Angel's offer of friendship, despite the fact that he saved them, mostly because he knows that Angel is a champion for the powers. However, Wes has given up on that fight instead, choosing his own path with his his own team. He doesn't stand in the way of Angel though, letting him continue his investigation, which brings me to my next point. A lot of this episode's plot devices seem incredibly convenient. For example, Wesley believes that Cordelia is in another plane. How? There's no evidence. There can't have been witnesses. Time stopped for God's sake. So Dinza is introduced, simply to forward the plot, only able to speak to dead people. So it's convenient that Angel is the only dead one who can feasibly do this to find Cordelia. The Axis holds the answer, even though it glows and as far as we know, are never told it has any kind of links to the powers or anything. Thing. If so, then why don't they use it again as a replacement of the visions? Despite that, I don't hate the episode, it's fine. It has Muir Smith written all over it. For example, the opening where we see Gwen's past and how she accidentally killed another boy. For someone they put a lot of effort into introducing, she doesn't do an awful lot in this episode, serving only as a brief hindrance to the team's pursuit of Cordelia. She will return again, but if you think she's ever going to be a big part of the story, you've got another thing coming. Although David Fury has written for Angel since the very beginning, including both the second episode of the show as well as Wesley's first episode, he was never a frequent contributor, writing only one episode for each of Angel's second and third seasons. However, at the beginning of season 4's development, he was made a consulting producer, being more active in the story's direction. His first episode concerns the team's travels to Las Vegas in search of Lorne, who they're hoping will read Angel in order to help him back on his path. Lorne is now a big sensation in Las Vegas, performing crowd interactive shows that have a sinister twist. Lorne is forced to reveal the audience members with bright futures with which the casino owner, named DeMarco, extracts using a fake casino game so that he can sell those futures to the highest bidder. Interesting concept. Lorne is very against this, but every time he refuses, DeMarco kills an innocent backup dancer. The team are aware of none of this, instead insulted when Lorne doesn't seem to recognise him backstage or during his performance. Angel gets thrown at the casino when he tries to do some snooping, as Gunn and Fred attempt to make contact with Lorne, which involves Fred disguising himself as a backup dancer to get into his dressing room. Turns out, Lorne hasn't forgotten them, and remember a few episodes back when he talked about Fluffy on the phone? Fluffy! Fluffy the dog, the dog you don't have? 
The universally recognized code for I'm being held prisoner? Send help? Angel makes his way back into the casino where DeMarco tricks him into playing the fake game for his future which renders him pointless. He just sits and pours quarters into machines that will never give him a win. Fred manages to break Lorne out of his dressing room and they make a break for it as Gunn runs into Angel who seems out of it. Once Lorne explains the game to Gunn he realises what's happened and they head back to rescue Angel. Cordelia watches from her hangar plane and in order to break Angel out of his stupor influences the slot machine to win the jackpot and is brought up to DeMarco's office along with the rest of the team who were easily caught on their way back in. Lauren smashes a crystal ball which holds all of the futures and they're restored to the rightful owners, including Angels. They all head back to the hotel where they find Cordelia. Who are you people? Oh, and it's all starting to kick off very soon, ladies and gents. Just a few more episodes to go. This one is okay. A lot of it is good banter and memorable moments without any of it really doing anything for the story. It's just a way to bring Lauren back with the only other notable moment being the ending with Cordelia's return. She seems to have amnesia, which the show will explore more in the next episode. The only other things that happen, which I didn't mention, were Angel's observation of Connor, who he continues to keep an eye on from a distance, just to check up on him, and Wesley poaching Angel's clients while he's out of town. Not that either of these events come back, but it's another showcase of the relationship these characters hold towards each other. Angel loves Connor because he's his son, and even though things are rough between them, he still wants him to be okay, that parental eye of guidance is still there for him. And Wesley has no hesitation in stealing business from the financially struggling team, whose financial problems seem to disappear with their explanation after this. That is, until you watch closely. Fred wins a ton of money at the casino, as you can see here. She also mentioned in an earlier episode that she was able to count cards, so this explains why even though the case aspect of Angel goes out the fucking window with this season, the team are still doing completely fine money-wise. Cordelia helps Angel from the higher plane, but how? I thought she could influence things. Could she not write them a letter or something? Is that too hard? I guess that doesn't matter since they know where she is now, and this mysterious force she can muster up is never really explained since she's back now, so whatever, just a minor plot hole. And the first episode written by our new showrunner, which will probably mean we're starting to get some sort of new plot now. And most of this episode takes place from Cordelia's POV as she adjusts to being thrusted into the world without any knowledge of who she is, where she is, where she was, or anything. She has complete and total amnesia of her personal life. The team decide to keep the demon hunting business a secret to not freak her out. However, not necessarily all demons as they do get Lauren to read her. I've found the greatest love of all inside. Besides the cool throwback to Cordelia singing the same Whitney Houston song she sang at her talent show back in season 1 of Buffy, Lorne's reaction here is chilling. He locks himself away in his room, refusing to speak to Angel, only telling him that it's something truly horrific and that it's coming soon. One of Lorne's demon clients takes a weird turn in the hotel and attacks Cordelia, who is saved by Connor. Oh, that's another thing. Connor was present when the team first saw Cordelia back, but chose not to make his presence known. He takes her back to his makeshift apartment in the loft of an old museum, I believe. The team wonder where she's gone to, finding only the dead body of the demon, which is when Wesley shows up with Answers. He overheard Lila on the phone, preparing a sting operation to kidnap Cordelia at Connor's place. He tips off the team and they head to Connor's, and Al assumes since Angel has been watching him that he knows where that is, and help Connor fight off Wolf and Hart's attacks. They retreat and Cordelia tells Angel that she'd rather stay with Connor than go back with Angel and the others, since Connor never lied about anything while all he did was mask the truth, which doesn't exactly help her get her memory back. The team head back to the hotel, finding a mind-sucked Lauren as the operation on Connor's place was a distraction so they could get to whatever Lauren read from Cordelia, extracting it from his memory. Wesley and Lila have a confrontation about both betraying each other, showcasing what kind of a relationship they actually have, one where they can't trust the other, and the episode kind of wraps up there. I see this episode as a set upper, where nothing really substantial happens that furthers any arcs, rather introduces them. The big thing is Cordelia, now without anything that makes her Cordelia, and she forms a close connection with Connor, who is the only person not to have lied to her when she returned. Like I mentioned, most of it takes place from her perspective, showing how creepy the team can be out of context until they completely abandon the idea around the halfway point so they can bring in Wesley, to actually lead the team to the Red Herring. Wesley and Lila's relationship is a fan favourite, mostly because it's built on mistrust. These two shouldn't get along, but after Wes's separation from the team and he begins to dislike them, he forms a bond with Lila, who also dislikes the team. However, when he's pissed off that Lila tricks them, right after Angel tells Wesley he forgives him, it makes Wes annoyed. Almost like a part of him in there wants to be a part of the team again and back with his friends. The episode, like I mentioned before, is structured sloppily, with conflicting ideas of how it wants to tell the episode's plot. It introduces an arc with Cordelia, which I will go in depth on later in the video, I know it's the elephant in the room that everyone knows I'm going to have to talk about at some point, but let's distract ourselves a little while longer with a Fred-centric episode. 
Kraft and Fane join the writing team and they'll be frequent contributors all the way until the end of the show. Their first episode, like I mentioned, is Fred-centric as she publishes a physics paper, keen to get back into her old work, and she's invited to speak at a conference where she runs into her old professor, Seidel. Gun and Angel turn up, as does Wesley, who shrugs off Lila's advances to do so, and she turns up to figure out why. Angel notices them, but he's suddenly distracted by a portal to Pylea opening again, with a large tentacle monster attempting to bring Fred back through the portal. This causes Fred to go a bit mad again during the night, similar to how she was when she first returned from Pylea, and Gun comforts her. Angel is convinced it's Lila that's responsible for the portal with good reason, but soon realises she was there for Wesley, and Angel heads back to the hotel. Nerdy guy. Older nerdy guy. Girl in black. There. Yeah, so here's something this season introduces that has never been spoken about in six seasons of this character before. Angel has a photographic memory. Now it does come out of nowhere, but will be brought up again and it does kind of help explain how he's been so good at drawing faces from memory all those times. He remembers a guy sitting behind them who wasn't too afraid of the massive tentacle monster. And it's that guy from iCarly who tried too hard to be like Jim Carrey, funnily enough. It's not him either, he's just a fan of demons from online forums. However, he does reveal that Fred wasn't the first physics student to go missing. And Fred discovers, while paying Professor Seidel a visit, that he he was responsible for sending her to Pylea, afraid that her work will outdo his. She plans to kill him as revenge for putting her through hell, which both Angel and Gunn are very against. So she goes to Wesley. He helps her with her question and she confronts him. Meanwhile, Angel goes to confront Seidel too and gets distracted by a demon while Fred opens a portal to suck Seidel through. Gunn arrives just in time and to stop Fred from feeling the guilt of killing another human being... <laughs> Gunn and Fred lie to Angel that Seidel fell into his own portal, and even though he was in the next room, he seems to buy it. But there's a reason for that. In other news, throughout the episode, scenes between Connor and Cordelia are spliced in between. Connor brings her some stuff from the hotel, and she begins to try and piece her life together to start remembering. Connor takes her hunting, and she kills her first vampire since returning from a higher plane before kissing Connor. <sighs> Cordelia realises that before she leads Connor on, she should probably get her memory back before making a big mistake and realising she doesn't like Connor in that way. So, she returns to Angel and asks him a question. There's something I need to know. Were we in love? So this episode begins the downfall of Fred and Gunn's relationship and begins Connor and Cordelia's romance. I'll talk more about how I feel about the latter in a later episode, but what I will say is that the reason for her kissing Connor is more because he's the only one who hasn't lied to her yet. You need to remember, this isn't Cordelia, or at least not the one we know. Her reasons for doing things right now are clouded by the fact that she doesn't know who she is. Fred misjudges Gunn's character severely when she tells Wesley that Gunn couldn't be capable of killing Seidel for her, so when he does, she begins to question just how well she actually knows her boyfriend. And funnily enough, the original plan was for Fred to kill Seidel, but Tim Minear stepped in and changed it so that they could work in a narrative of doubt, allowing things to change for these characters, because god forbid any of them are actually happy for a decent period of time. One thing I'll note is that I thought it was an inconsistency, which I've not seen brought up anywhere else, it's that Seidel is supposed to have been the one who sent Fred to Pylea. However, when Cordy had her vision, you know, when she saw Fred read from the book herself, eh? She read from the book herself. It's possible that the book was unrelated, but then the team found the same book and that's how they got there, to Pylea. It's also possible that Seidel planted it so that she would read it, or he gave it to her, but it's odd that they just retcon this without explaining how she got the book or why it was in the library when a random person could read it. If she was targeted, Wesley helps Fred picking her over Lila as soon as the question was raised, showing that he still loves her, he still wants her, however he's content with the idea of never having her. He's moved on to a degree, but Lila is concerned that Wes might float back to the team if the opportunity arose simply to get close to Fred again, coupled with her relationship with Gunn breaking down, there might be more than a little motivation for him to come back very soon. Joss Whedon's only contribution to the season, and my god, it has his writing all over it. The episode is narrated by Lorne, telling the tale of how a spell aimed to get Cordelia her memory back ends with the entire team losing most of their memories, reverting them all back to teenagers. They need six people to complete the ritual so Lorne calls Wesley in, and he finally has that confrontation with Gunn that we've been waiting for, where Gunn warns him not to move on Fred, as well as the breakdown of their friendship and trust. What happened to you, man? I had my throat cut and all my friends abandoned me. 
love that scene. Like I mentioned, the spell goes wrong and the only person not affected by the spell is Lorne, who is also unconscious for a lot of the episode. The team all begin to speculate that it's some sort of test, and Wes aims to take the lead and understand why they're all here and for what reason. They believe Lorne to be the devil and sellotape him to a chair, and Wes theories that they're supposed to kill a vampire in order to escape. They split up to try and find it until Angel, who now thinks he's Liam, discovers that he's the vampire and tries to hide it from the team, when they start wondering if the vampire is one of them. Lorne wakes up and exposes Liam, who decides to embrace the vampire within him and tries to attack Cordelia. Wesley takes a tumble as Connor shows up, presumably to keep an eye on Cordy, and both Angel and himself share a brief conversation about fathers and how much they can suck. It's been a whole while, I know good and well. He's had his share of sinning. Sounds kind of like my father. Oh, is he a self-righteous bastard? You'd be amazed. Lorne manages to convince Fred that he isn't evil and he creates a magic formula to revert them all back to their normal selves, luckily before Connor and Liam kill each other, and that includes Cordelia. She's the last to get her memory back, instantly having a vision hit her of a mysterious beast waking up, which causes her to run away. Angel catches up to her and asks if they were in love. Were we in love? We were. This is the black sheep of the season, because Whedon's influence takes over the usual narrative flow and structure to put his own unique spin on it. And there's many examples of this, like when Lorne is narrating, including a scene where the camera is panning back and forth between the characters as Lorne describes the love triangle between Gunfred and Wes, or when he narrates to the viewer while he's unconscious at that part of the story. The original conception of the episode was due to the writers missing the old Wesley and wanted a way to revert him back to that form for an episode and decided to do it with the entire team. Think of it as Angel's tabula rasa, so to speak. And there's a few references if you're paying attention, such as Cordelia saying, Hello, salty goodness. When she sees Angel, a direct quote from what she said when she saw him the first time back in Buffy. They poke fun at how Liam claims to be Irish, yet doesn't have an Irish accent at all, and because he's from the 1700s, he's anti-English, is terrified of cars, and even refers to Gunn as a slave. Oh, just we Wes is back to falling over and making an arse of himself, which I have missed, and apparently so did most of the cast, as this episode was a nightmare to film due to the actors not being able to keep a straight face for almost any take. Liam! The big thing is Cordy getting her memory back and what else awakens alongside her. There's more to this moment and oh boy when we get to it, I'm gonna go absolutely tonto with too many emotions to count. This also kind of quashes the romance between Angel and Cordelia which it wasn't liked by a lot of people at the time. So they start trying to nail that coffin in the, the fucking worst way possible next episode. But to go back to spin the bottle and look at it as a whole, it's a fantastic episode and a standout of the season. Gunn tries to act like his relationship with Fred is the same as it ever was, but when she isn't exactly enthusiastic about moving in with him one day, things start to come crashing down. They come back from a case to have an argument, ending with Fred running off to her room. Cordelia is back staying with Connor, fuck's sake, and she begins having bad dreams and visions of whatever is coming for them. Connor actually goes to Angel and asks him to speak to her about it, which he does, and this is where Cordelia tells Angel that when she was a higher being, she could see everything Angel did as Angelus, and although she loves Angel, she could never be with him after seeing every deadly action he once did. Just then, she gets another vision of the beast she saw last episode rising out of the ground. Wes returns home to find Lila dressed as Fred in an attempt to seduce him since she caught him watching her speech two episodes ago. While Wes isn't exactly amused by this, the two begin making out when Wesley says, Leave them on. Angel heads to Wolford Heart, torturing Gavin as Lila arrives, wanting to know what exactly they took out of Lauren's head when they sucked his brain of anything he read from Cordelia. He convinces Lila that giving him back what they took would be a win-win, as either Angel saves the world and they get to keep operating, or he dies trying. Cordelia takes Connor to the spot where her vision of the beast took place, which coincidentally is the exact alleyway that Connor was born, and the beast does rise, wiping the floor with Connor, simply laughing at Cordelia, before flying away. Wesley comes to the team after he figures out that the apocalypse is happening and wants to work with them, pulling their knowledge and strength together to have the best chance at stopping it. Angel agrees and they work to decipher the papers that Wolfman Hart have from Lauren's head. It's Gunn that figures out it's one big picture and it turns out to be a massive X in a box and Lauren discovers just exactly where the X is on the map when he places the location of all of today's calls. It leads the team to a building where they find the beast and a ton of dead bodies. They try everything to take it down including some gunplay from Wesley but the battle is truly over when the beast stabs Angel in the neck and throws him off the fucking roof. He begins a rain of fire signifying that the end is nigh before flying away again. All of the characters watch on in horror this site as Cordelia decides that Connor shouldn't die a virgin. What? Oh Jesus. God, who wrote this episode again? Ah! 
Oh Christ, I would have thought this man would have learned his lesson after pushing the boundaries on Buffy. But no, he's back and in full swing with his questionable plot lines and dialogue. In that context, the Connor and Cordelia thing does seem entirely on point for tonight. Angel seems to have recovered from his plummet and heads to Connor's place to check on Cordelia and his son and sees them from an adjacent rooftop. So, and from this episode amongst Angel viewers, where the controversial plot of the fourth season truly begins and shit hits the fan much quicker than anyone could have anticipated, we have to talk about Connor and Cordelia. This, this is off the wall insane. There's a very good reason for it to happen, which we won't find out until about ten episodes from now, but regardless, there were other ways to do this plotline. It's entirely to turn Angel against his own son and Cordelia, which didn't need to happen. It's so frustrating because I wish I could speak about this freely right now, but because it won't make sense in the context of where we are, I have to wait to enter Tonto mode. The next thing is how I feel about Gun and Fred's breakup plotline, in that I don't know how I feel about it at all. I can see both sides of the argument, and why Fred is mad at Gun, and why Gun did what he did, although he goes about arguing his point very poorly. Fred, it's not who you are. It isn't in your heart. But it's in yours. It is now. Wesley becomes a member of the team again, finally. He gets a lot of good scenes this episode, including the rooftop fight, which is my favourite part of the episode. I also like the scene where he tells Lila to keep the glasses on. It really shows the viewer that Wes still yearns for Fred. He wants her, and it's just making do with Lila. The Beast is introduced as our villain for the second act of the season. Note the fact that I didn't use the phrase Big Bad, as the Beast is not the true holder of that mantle for this season. He seems to have a connection with Connor, being born from the exact spot he was. To close off this episode, I want to bring your attention back two seasons ago to Dead End, where Lindsay sung these lyrics in the song he sang in the bronze. Unintentional but still the foreshadowing. I fucking love this episode. Seriously, comparing this to the other two zombie episodes tackled by both shows being Dead Man's Party and The Thin Dead Line, this episode shows how building tension in a great atmosphere can really up the horror factor. Angel reacts to Cory and Connor in the same way I think everyone else did. <laughs> Wesley breaks up with Lila, officially picking a side in the apocalypse. Funny thing about black and white. You mix it together and you get grey. And it doesn't matter how much white you try and put back in, you're never going to get anything but grey. Okay, I think Belle is going for something poetic here, but it, it doesn't really work. And Connor, believing himself to be connected to the Beast in some form, and also not blind to the fact that he's definitely not human and at least somewhat part demon, visits Lila at Wolfram and Hart to learn more about himself. They threaten to cut him open, but it doesn't get very far as the Beast arrives and begins terrorising the employees of the building. He massacres them, bodies lying everywhere as people flock for the exits, Gavin is killed while trying to find an emergency exit in the janitor's closet. Uh... Hi. Lila runs into Wesley, who heard about what was happening from a mole he had in Wolfram and Hart, and they escape through that same emergency exit. However, Lila drops the bombshell about Connor also being in the building, doing the right thing, even though she's supposed to be evil. How very Lindsay of her. Wes tells the team and they break back into Wolfram and Hart, however, now the bodies of everyone the Beast has killed begin to reanimate, and we go full zombie flick as they hurry to find Connor. They do, and plan to escape using the White Room, which Angel finally tells them about. Yeah, remember the little girl from last season when Angel was looking for a way to court off? Well, thanks to that new photographic memory, Angel knows the code and they find the beast draining the life from the girl, who manages to whisper one phrase to them before teleporting them back to the hotel. Answer is among you. In the final scene of the episode, Angel reveals to Cordelia that he knows about her and Connor. Take your new boyfriend and get the hell out of here. This is similar to the premiere when Angel told Connor to do the same thing. The strength of this episode's second half is unassailable. I wish Angel did this more often, that sort of horror aspect of the show that was lost in season one, and it just goes to show how effective it can be when applied correctly. The Beast proves himself to be one hell of a foe for the team, however this zombifying trick he can do once he kills a human is never seen again, due to the fact that he never kills a human on screen again unless it's draining them of their energy like what he did with the girl. So the zombies make their only appearance here. The traditional horror tropes play brilliantly with 
the new feel that this season starts to form from this episode onwards, which is one that is more dark and cold, but the humour being much more sporadic rather than a constant. Now, unlike some others, this isn't a change I dislike. Remember that Angel was originally supposed to be much darker than Buffy, but due to the writers not being able to make it work as they'd expected, David Greenwald began to morph the show's tone into one that's more Buffy-esque, should I say? Some would argue that it doesn't work in this season either, but if there's one episode I'll point to that I think disproves that, it's this one. The main event for the story is the girl's line, the answer is among you. The team will begin to rack their brains as to what that means and who she's talking about. Does one of them have a connection with the beast? Is someone not being entirely truthful? All will be revealed in due time. Gavin is killed in this episode and for a character that's been around for nearly two seasons, this is a poor death. They really didn't have a clue what to do with this character. He struggled during season 3 when he was brought in to replace Lindsay, who was such a scene stealer, so he was already at a disadvantage. I'll miss his potential more than I'll miss his character. Gunn is trying very hard to be more unlikable than Connor at the moment, becoming incredibly snippy and snarky with Wesley, blaming him for trying to break up him and Fred, even though it's because he killed Seidel. Wesley just happens to be here and Gunn feels intimidated. Cordelia is kicked from the team temporarily by Angel for a very good reason, and she'll continue living with Connor. Great episode. Much better than Buffy's take on zombies, that's for sure. <laughs> Going back to what I said just last episode, being that that particular episode I would use to disprove what some may say about the direction of this season. This episode is the one I would choose to agree with those people, as this is such a mess of new ideas just structured horrendously. I wouldn't blame people for judging the whole season on this. For reference, when I take notes about the episode's plot points and my thoughts and opinions, usually it doesn't take up more than a single side of an A4 piece of paper. This is the only episode I've watched of either show that has gone beyond that. So much shit happens here, so I'm going to sum it up as quickly as possible so this video doesn't go anywhere near the two hour mark. Are you ready? Keep up. Gwen appears to tell the team about a commissioner of hers getting their life sucked out by the beast, obtaining something from their body, and the team get to researching at Connor's apartment. Cordelia gets a vision of the beast again, this time talking, but no words are heard, so she runs to Angel too. Wesley identifies the little girl in the white room as Mesic Tet, one of five totems of the Ra Tet who bring balance to the world linked to the gods. Two are dark, two are light, and one is neutral. Gwen's commissioner was another totem, and Lorne arrives back from gathering information to tell them that a third totem has been killed. Angel and Gwen head to Death Valley to protect one of the last two remaining totems to find that he's also dead. This leaves them with Manjet, or Manny, the final surviving totem, the neutral totem, who also headed to Death Valley to try and build strength in numbers. Because Manny is a neutral totem, he doesn't hold any special powers, he's just an immortal human being. Angel and Gwen take him back to the hotel, where Manny tells them all that the beast is planning to use the talismans he's been collecting from the totems to build one single talisman, which, once applied correctly, will block out the sun, starting with Los Angeles and slowly working its way around the entire world emphasis on slowly. They take Manny to Gwen's place, which reveals she's incredibly rich, funded by the Axis of Pythia, which Angel gave back to her once he found Cordelia, and since it's worth 33 million dollars, it gave her the sufficient funds to build her own mansion in disguise of an abandoned building. They lock Manny in a secure cell, taking turns to watch over him. Gwen and Guns goes fine, but Angel and Cordelia's watch, during which they are drugged, knocking them out, and Manny is killed, leaving no totems of balance left. The security tapes are all wiped, and the log indicating that whoever began their meddling did it before Gun and Gwen's watch was over, indicating an inside job. Returning to the hotel, Wes and Fred come up with a plan of sending the beast through a portal to another dimension to stop him from causing any more havoc. And Angel decides to include Connor in their fight, believing his son to be innocent when it comes to being the answer among them, although he's given zero reason to do so. The beast shows up at Connor's apartment right at that moment, throwing him out the window so he can begin the ritual needed to block out the sun. The team heads up and puts on a good fight, sending the beast through the portal, however it's too late, as the sun is blocked out, leaving Los Angeles open to be a demon playground 24-7. Suddenly the beast returns. Angelus. Then he just leaves again, and Cordelia has her vision again, this time with sound, and it reveals that the Beast was talking to, and has met, Angelus. Angel claims to have no memory of this interaction, but Wesley suggests that Angelus might, and to find out what the Beast is up to, and if he has a thrall over Angel without him knowing, they must bring back Angelus. <gasps> <sighs> This is like the plot summary of a double episode, but it's one 40 minute episode that just goes on and on and on. As soon as something is introduced, here comes another thing, and then another. Now, after all this totem business and Gwen coming back, who by the way just vanishes after this for a while, now we're bringing back Angelus. This is a problem that stays with the season throughout. If you're good at paying attention, you'll have no problem understanding this season. But if you look away from this episode for even a fucking second, you'll miss something that's vital to understanding the plot comprehensively. There's also so much to this episode that only makes sense once you've watched the entire season, so some glaring plot holes I can't talk about finally make sense later on. Ugh, what do I even say now? 
Well, the Beast's plan is finally unveiled, but why does he want to block out the sun? We don't know, and trust me, there is still so much to this that bringing it up now would be pointless. The team effectively loses though, which brings them to their conclusion through Cory's vision that Angel, or more accurately Angelus, is the answer among them. Gwen returns in another Mere Smith episode, so I guess this is her character? This episode is what happens when you give Mere Smith a predominantly case-based writer who rarely contributes to main plots, but usually does a sufficient job the big plot episode. I guess they didn't want to stretch this out too long, but in the same episode we learn about what the beast is trying to do, he does. Where does that leave us? Without a villain that has a motive, so now we have to bring in a new one, Angelus. Start from scratch nearly halfway through the season. Dearie, dearie me. The actual story, if structured more carefully, is fine. I just don't understand why all this had to be now, while episodes like The House Always Wins and Spin the Bottle, which are largely singular and those of which his plot points could have been added in other episodes, are here. When we could have had this episode's plot stretched out over a few episodes, not going on for too long, but yet having a greater shock impact when the team lose and Angelus is their only option. If they'd tackled this for longer and had more time to think of their options, leaving Angelus as a last ditch, it would make that seem more plausible than rushing to conclusions for a good hook ending. What a mess. Wesley recruits Wu Pang, a mystic who has the power to remove souls and put them back using magic, and Angel begrudgingly agrees when Fred's research comes up with no answers as to how to bring the sun back, and a conversation with Cordelia leads Angel to realise that only Angelus could be as smart and cunning as the Beast in this situation. Connor is as jumpy as ever, mostly due to Angelus being brought up. But it was you all along. You're the one who's working with the Beast. I'm not. Well then you're a puppet. Ah, <laughs> not yet. The team builds a cage to hold Angelus and the ritual begins. During said ritual, Wu Pang tries to kill Angel out of nowhere and the team puts him down. Through finding some writing on Wu Pang's body, the team finds that a magical sword was made to destroy the beast centuries ago and Angel, Cory, Wes and Connor head out to find it, going through an Indiana Jones-like tomb with puzzles and challenges for their reward. They get the sword and Cordelia begins to fall for Angel again when she saves him. They kiss and are caught by Connor, who runs off. Back at the hotel, the beast attacks and begins to get the better of Angel, snapping the sword in two. Suddenly, Connor reappears and makes up with his father, accepting him as a hero and not a villain like Angelus is. Angel kills the beast with Connor's help and the sun is restored. That night, Angel and Cordelia finally get busy. I know last episode I mentioned that a few episodes were singular when they didn't have to be to allow the plot to happen more smoothly, but this reveal is so well done and I can't help but love it. It's one of those things that even when you're certain it's not real, the longer it goes on and on, you start to doubt yourself. So when it's revealed, even if you called it early on, you still feel like an idiot, with Angelus laughing at the viewer mockingly as we fade out. I will say it doesn't have as much impact on a rewatch once you know what's coming. The reason for it is that Wu Pang's magic involves causing Angel to lose his soul in a vivid vision to trick his mind into achieving pure happiness. This explains why he calls out Buffy's name when sleeping with Cordelia, because he associates pure happiness with her. But it wouldn't be feasible for Buffy to appear out of nowhere, although I would have loved if they could have done so. It wouldn't have made it as believable of an ending, but regardless, it's still powerful. I love Angel's speech in the vision, it's exactly what he stands for and sums up the motivation of the team brilliantly. We've never let the darkness win. And it's not because of the powers that be, or the super strength, or the magical weapons. It's because we believe in each other. This is an effective way of introducing our next villain of the season before the big bad finally shows their face. So, the bulk of this episode takes place in the hotel, with each member of the team bar Lauren taking their turns having conversations with Angelus, who's locked in the cage they built, using his skills of manipulation simply to cause chaos between them as much as he can. He begins his psychological meddling by sharing a fantastic scene with Wesley, which takes up the bulk of the episode's first act. As the rest of the team watch on via a security monitor, he begins to mention his love for Fred, and this later causes Wes to kiss Fred when he thinks they're alone, and Fred doesn't exactly jump at pushing him away. Gunn pretty much catches them, and this causes a fist fight between Gunn and Wesley to commence, which ends with Gunn reeling back to hit Wes, accidentally colliding with Fred. <laughs> Ain't much to come back from now, Gunn. I love the scene afterwards when Angelus listens in on his chaos with glee. He reveals to the team that Connor and Cordelia slept together, which the rest of the team didn't know and it understandably grosses them out. You and me both, guys. Connor confronts Angelus next who tries to use Connor's hatred towards him as a way to get set free, but before Connor can do anything, Cordelia arrives and kicks him out, cutting off the cameras so that she can make a private negotiation with Angelus. She offers that he tells them everything he knows about the beast and in return, he will get her 
and be allowed to do whatever he wants with her. You think that's messed up? Well, Angelus doesn't believe this at all, so Cordelia does something to convince him, but we never see what it is, and for God's sake, please do not speculate in the comments section. He tells the team about meeting the beast in 1789, and that he tried to employ Angelus to help him kill three mystical priestesses who wanted the beast dead, but Angelus said no and the beast got killed by said priestesses. These mystical priestesses actually live in LA, and Wes, Cordy and Connor go to find them so that they can help banish the beast once again. But wait, if they did it once before, why aren't they already out there trying to do it again? If they know it's the beast, oh they're dead, that's why. Ugh. This includes their entire families, and the sight of dead kids is too much for Connor suddenly having a humanising train of thought. Some vampires show up and the three escape, heading back to the hotel, where Cordy tells Angelus that since the team didn't stop the beast with Angelus' information, that their deal is off, and that they will now restore his soul. What? Angel's soul? It's gone. I love this episode. A fun fact, this episode was directed by Sean Astin, who you may recognise from his roles in both Lord of the Rings and Stranger Things. He expressed to his friend Doug Petrie, who you may recognise as more of a writer on Buffy rather than Angel, that he wanted to try his hand at directing, resulting in him getting the gig to direct this episode. And that being said, people are at the top of their game here. It's great to see Angelus back, although there's one glaring fatal flaw in his reappearance, which I'll bring up when we get to the end of this arc, and I feel that it undermines the entire point of his character even existing. Look, there are two sides to Angelus as a villain the violent side and the psychological side, both of which bring him pleasure in the chaos they produce. Now when he was on Buffy, these two sides play hand in hand. The prime example I always give is when he kills Jenny, a violent act, simply so that he can watch Buffy's reaction, providing a psychological reasoning. I'm going to say this now, but the writing talent on Angel at this point in time is far inferior to the writing Buffy had during its second season, and with Angelus here, we see one side or the other. There's no hand in hand. He's either completely violent and wants to kill people, or he's entirely psychological and wants to fuck with people's heads. There's no in between, be it for plot reasons like the cage, or no reason at all. He will do both with the team, but not to a believable effect that this is the Angelus we know on Buffy. I have more to say, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. His conversations are a favourite of mine, especially the first one he has with Wes, which takes up the first quarter of the episode. Wesley knows what Angelus is like from the books he's read, but aside from that one time in season one when Angel thought he was Angelus briefly when he was drugged, which I believe ended with... <laughs> Leslie, no! Ah yes, good record so far. However, Wes gets to meet the real deal and thinks he can outsmart him in some way, resulting in Wes getting successfully manipulated to act on his love for Fred. And the chain of events kisses Gun and Fred's relationship goodbye. So who stole the soul and where's it gone? Don't forget, the answer is among you. Oh no, not the dreaded three writers. Last time we had three writers was on Buffy's fourth season during the episode Doomed, which to me showed that the writers had no idea where the story was going and had to retcon certain plot points to make things work. Guess what? The team questions Wu Pang about Angel's soul going missing and he tells them that if the container that's in is broken, Angel's soul will disappear forever. While Gunn and Fred wrap up their relationship, Lila comes out of nowhere through the sewers and attempts to persuade Angelus to kill the beast as she's the last remaining member of Wolfram and Hart. In what universe was that going to work as she's chased off when she's spotted on the camera? Wes catches up to her and finds her bleeding. Bleeding? From like four episodes ago, she's still bleeding? How long has it been canonically? I know Awakening was almost all made up, so has it been like a day? Two tops? She's carrying a book with a passage in it about the beast. Wes claims that he has the same book which has no passage whatsoever about the beast, and Lila reveals that her contacts from WNH managed to locate it in another dimension. This leads West to believe that some force at some point in time erased all knowledge and memory of the beast from this dimension which explains why they couldn't find anything about him in their research, and why Angel didn't remember the beast yet Angelus did since he wasn't present at the time. I'm going to go into more detail in a second about how this doesn't make any fucking sense at all. They theorise that the beast may have servants, but Angelus, for some reason, reveals that the beast is a servant of something much bigger. Gun watches over Angelus while the team researches this new information and he tells Gunn that he knew they killed Seidel and that he didn't fall into his own portal. Come on, even Angel's not that stupid. It's Gunn that tells Angelus it was him and not Fred, which leads into more meddling from Angelus that Wesley is now darker than he is, which is why she's falling for him. Wes brings Lila in to help, which the rest of the team are sceptical about, and Wes learns that Fred isn't with Gunn anymore. We're not together anymore.
Wes leaves when Lila and Cordy show up, where Cordy has a vision of a way to conveniently get Angel's soul back, and Fred rushes to tell Wes who's watching over Angelus, where he reveals to her that Wesley slept with Lila, and that can lose any chance he has at this point in time. Gunn and Connor dig for the skull of a soul eater, which they get and the ritual commences. Angel's soul is restored and he even sings for Lorne to prove it, sending them out to work on stopping the beast. When it's only him and Cordy left, Angelus reveals that he was never Angel and it was all a trick. Huh? He knocks her out and slips past Fred, escaping into Los Angeles, loose to wreak havoc. Thing is, since the sun's been out for a while, there's no one to wreak havoc on, so he decides to just head back to the place where he knows people are, and that's the hotel. The team stupidly decide to all go after Angelus, leaving only Cordelia and Lila behind, to kill him before he can kill anyone himself. However, his double back allows him to enter the hotel without anyone there to stop him, and he chases down Lila, toying with her. Lila luckily finds Cordelia. He's gonna kill us. I know. Why do you think I let him out, you stupid bitch? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just mentally preparing myself to try and explain the absolute mess this episode is. If you thought Long Day's Journey was crammed full of plot, this episode has about half an episode's plot stretched over the runtime. Angelus gets out, and Cordelia kills Lila. The entire first half is almost nothing, with with little bits of lore and explanation given to tie up loose ends that really didn't need tying up, and sometimes don't even tie things up effectively. Firstly, let's talk about this device that a force wiped out any knowledge or memory of the beast from this dimension. Fine. Fine. If the force is powerful enough, which we will soon learn it is, this makes sense. What doesn't is Angelus being able to remember but Angel not. We learned through his seasons on Buffy that Angelus and Angel were the same being. Angelus got his soul back and felt remorse for his crimes, no longer wishing to go by the Angelus name, changing to Angel. They're the same guy, but since Angel the series began, Angelus seems to be a name that they associate with a different individual altogether. Now if they're trying to say that Angelus seems so distant from Angel now that it's suitable to see them as different entities, then that's fine, but they're not actually Actually, Angelus is Angel. They share all memories and thoughts. There is no part of Angelus in Angel's conscience because they're the same person. Now there's conveniently memories that Angelus has that can be wiped from Angel's conscience, but not also Angel's conscience, just under a different agenda. That's a jarring retcon if ever I've seen one. How many writers were on this again? Oh, that's right, three. The next thing is Cordelia killing Lila and telling her that she let Angelus out on purpose. Should I unfold this all now? I may as well, since the next few episodes are going to be more focused on a crossover than this. So, Cordelia isn't Cordelia. She deliberately lets Angelus free because she's actually the powerful force that the beast works for. Remember when he laughed at her? It was because she was pretending to be scared and he knew it. This entity got control of Cordy when Lauren got her memory back and spin the bottle, which also awakened the beast at the same time. All of these convenient visions and leads and souls going missing, spells going wrong and jealous getting free, it's all been Cordelia, who I will now call Imposter Cordelia until we find out her real name. This is why I haven't been going mad when she's done something out of character, like sleeping with Connor for example. It's an awful storyline, and I hate it, but even still, this moment means something to the story, and not just to turn Angel against his own son. When that moment happens, and I can go behind the scenes on it, I'll go berserk. Also, Lila's dead. A look her sudden that was for a character who's been around since season one. She'll get more spotlight next episode, and I need to move on. There's so many characters in this story. As soon as you think everybody that's important to the story is present, another villain is introduced, or another ally joins the team for a while. And as a perfect example, Angelus finds Lila's body, which is when Gunn and Wes find Angelus and think he's responsible, very much a homage to when Buffy thought he drank from her mother in season 1 of that show. He escapes and Wesley is forced to decapitate Lila as they're unsure if she'll come back as a vampire or not. He does so in a chilling scene where he talks to a vision of Lila in his head, arguing about their so-called relationship which reveals that Wesley did care for Lila in some form, and that she wasn't just a compromise for Fred even if that's what she started as, and then became again when he reconnected with the team. He does the deed as Connor plans to go out and hunt Angelus again, being stopped by imposter Cordy as she feigns illness. Angel searches for the beast's location from the patrons in the demon bar, getting nowhere, instead following the scent of her blood to the knife that killed her, which the beast now has. The beast tries to convince Angelus to join their side, since Angelus plays a big part in his master's plans, but Angelus refuses and imposter Cordelia appears when he runs off, officially revealing her as the beast's master. But you'd be dumb if you didn't get that by this point, considering how last episode ended. They shed a disturbing kiss as Lorne performs the infamous sanctuary spell on the hotel, forbidding any demon violence of any kind, in case Angelus shows up again. Wesley goes to find the only person who could take Angelus on toe-to-toe -to -toe and live 
who isn't busy with her own show. So it's Faith. Because Angel played a key role in reshaping Faith and never gave up on her, unlike everyone else, he knows that she will be keen to restore his soul rather than killing him, and because she's a slayer, she can get right in the thick of it with the right training and live. She escapes prison laughably easy, I might add, and they flee back to the dark Los Angeles, where Faith is introduced to the team, and she tells him that Angelus will get his soul back and that they aren't going to kill him. While some take kindly to a strong leader again, Imposter Cordy, and because he has to ruin everything Connor, both are hostile towards her sudden appearance, and the trust they're meant to put into her immediately. Angelus hears from around turn after West Tess Faith still has her chops as a slayer and some vamps escape in terror that a slayer is indeed in town. Hi, Dawn. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> is your sister home? She is. It's the other one. A fun fact, this is Angel's only interaction with Dawn in the entire lore of the show that's shown on screen. He obviously knows her since she never existed when he was around, however, although they were planned to eventually meet, they never do, and this is all we get. And he's not even Angel, he's Angelus. West Gun Connor and Faith head out to hunt Angelus, and Connor leads him to a factory where Angelus' scent leads, and he directly disobeys Faith's orders to not kill the first vampire that jumps out of them in case it's Angelus, and Faith sternly instructs him with a crossbow to the neck to head back to the hotel, and Gun agrees to head back with him. This leaves only Wes and Faith to take on Angelus, who is now expected her and he's now with the beast. He claims to have changed his mind, now working alongside the beast and the beast proceeds to beat Faith up, who is completely unprepared to take it on, expecting Angelus. When she's down on the ground, Angelus reveals that the only thing that can kill a beast is powerful is a weapon forged from its own bones, and he then stabs the beast in the back with it. How did he get this? Well, last episode, the beast made it himself in a one-off scene, offering it to his master, who we now know as Imposter Cordy. She used that dagger to kill Lila and planted it next to the body for Angelus to find and tempt him into joining their side, which backfires exponentially since you've got to be stupid to know that Angelus is a lone soldier. Killing the beast brings back the sun, which Angelus was unaware would happen, and Faith uses his opportunity to smash a window, causing Angelus to run and hide from the sun before he can kill Faith on his own. Back at the hotel, the team are all ecstatic at the sun's return, and Connor runs up to Cordelia's room where she claims to be resting from an earlier collapse, and begins to rave about Faith's achievement, hinting that Connor admired her courage in standing up to him, something that he's never experienced a woman do before in such a threatening manner, and he might be falling for- Bye, Jingo. There's a life growing inside of me, and it's ours. We're connected now. It was, go it was going so well. This episode was fantastic, and then the final scene brings back this fucking relationship which I thought was over when Cordy was kicked out by Angel. But no, there's probably a reason why this part of the season is fondly remembered despite coming in between bits of dog shit, and that's due to two reasons. One is that David Fury writes this episode, a veteran writer for Buffy, who has his shit together and doesn't make it up as he goes along, absolutely learning his lesson with season four of Buffy. His comedy provides this episode with a mix of familiarity yet uncertainty, which is a tone I love but is incredibly hard to explain effectively, so I did my best there. The other is the return of Faith for the first time in over two seasons, and showcases how far she's come in prison with Angel's encouragement. We see her actively avoid killing an inmate who attempts to kill her, and the newly hardened Wesley unofficially resumes his role as Watcher, making up for the first time. And this is a truly superb idea! I love the scene where he throws Faith into action unexpectedly to see if she's still got the stuff, which of course she does. That, she's the one you want. Claire. Faith proves herself to be the only character capable of keeping Connor under control, who, although initially is hostile towards Faith, learns to respect her when she stands up to him, kicking his ass back down to planet Earth. And this is the only dynamic between Connor and another character that I actually enjoy, and if they were ever going to establish a romance for Connor, to be honest, I'd have picked Faith. She would have kept him grounded and calm, and the two could have built a strong relationship together, but alas, here comes the baby. And the plot seems compact for once and sufficient progress is made without further complications being shoved down our throats, that is, until, like I just mentioned before, the final scene. Where's my door clip? <laughs> Okay, I know this isn't Connor's fault and he's been manipulated into impregnating Imposter Cordy, but my god, there wasn't one point in Kortoth where Holtz was bored and told him about sex ed. Okay, that's a stretch, but Gunn and Fred should have had a talk with him. I'm not even Angel trying to teach him right from wrong, just choosing to force him out on his own. Like, I'm not a parent, but I'm pretty sure that's fucked. Putting all of that aside, I really do like this episode. Faith and Wes return to his apartment after the fight, and Faith destroys Wesley's shower in anger that after all this time she got the shit kicked out of her during her first proper fight back on the good side. In that demon bar I mentioned earlier, Angelus is haunted by a booming voice belonging to the Beastmaster, which is of course Imposter Cordy, but she hides her voice. It's here we find out properly that she did steal the soul, and instead of destroying it, she keeps it in the hotel under her bed. That's truly safe, provided the team were stupid enough to not, I don't know, search the one place they knew where it was thoroughly? Angelus decides he wants to learn more about the Beastmaster, now that he's been contacted by a begrudgingly help 
helping the master and attempts to trick Fred into giving it up since he has a charm that renders him able to attack under the sanctuary spell, but it's all bullshit and he grabs a bunch of the research from the table, fleeing. Fred attempts to hit him with the tranquilizer but hits Lauren in the process. He unfortunately doesn't have nearly as classic a fall as Giles did. Connor tries to stop Angelus but the sanctuary spell prevents Connor from attacking him and well, since we know from his time on this show so far, Connor isn't entirely human and part demon in some form. On his way out the door he runs into Faith and Wes who he takes hostage, telling Faith that she has a free shot but that he'll kill Wes if she shoots. Faith doesn't shoot and Wes confronts her about this later. Angelus was right. You should have gone for him. He would have killed you. And how many will have the chance to murder now because you let that make a difference? They head out to try and catch Angelus' trail whilst Angelus is threatened by the Beastmaster again for not helping and that if he doesn't soon, they will restore his soul which gets him moving. Fred tries to reignite her romance with Gunn which doesn't work as all the passion between them is gone. Imposter Cordy convinces Connor not to tell anyone about her pregnancy. All the while, Faith and Wes track down Angelus' previous location at a demon bar where they find some junkies in the back getting high from vampire bites similar to Riley in season 5 of Buffy and Faith attempts to get information from one of them but she claims not to know anything and Faith accepts this. Wesley, in one of my favourite scenes of his, stabs the woman to convince her not to continue lying and she admits that she did see a man matching Angela's description and that he was talking to himself about the beast's plans. Faith confronts Wes about harming a human to further their efforts and a complete role reversal from the last time these two shared conflict over what was right and wrong when it came to harming humans. In season 3 of Buffy, Wesley wanted to imprison Faith for accidentally committing murder and then tried to cover it up with his Faith basically summed up her reasoning as shit happens. A reason that Wesley understands now, twisting Faith's arm by making out of line comments that anger her, he tells her that Angelus will do the same and to not hesitate like she did earlier. Lauren finally awakens and comments on the fake charm that Angelus was holding, citing that he knows where they're made since they're infamous tourist traps. They tip off Wes and Faith who head to the building where they're sold, obviously after hours, where there's construction going on and finally the fight between Faith and Angelus, who's expecting Faith's arrival. Wes is taken out of the fight fairly early on and as the fight grows to a close and Faith backs down... <laughs> highlight for me this episode is definitely Wes and Faith, as Wesley finally becomes the watcher that Faith needed, not afraid to kill or die for the cause, something which Faith has to learn again, just not as psychotic this time. The interrogation scene, followed subsequently by Wes's taunting, are two fantastic examples of character work all around, writing and acting for both Wes and Faith. Wes claims to have brung Faith in as she's the only one he believes will try the hardest to restore his soul, but I speculate also because she's the only one who will stand a chance against him if she has to kill him, which he has to train her to do. She gets better at the end of the episode, but we'll talk about that next episode. Surprisingly, Connor and Imposter slash Pregnant Cordy take a back seat in this episode following the reveal as Imposter Cordy must annoy Angelus. This doesn't work as all that happens is he doesn't listen, decides to investigate with the gang's research, and then continues not to listen, biting Faith. He's a loose cannon, and I suppose this is to remind the viewer in case they forgot how Angelus operated when he was on Buffy, or, um, last episode? Alright, here's my big problem with Angelus here. He doesn't kill anyone. No, I'm serious. Go back and watch. He doesn't kill a single human being through his entire arc in this season. I think that's like one of his most defining traits as a character when he worked in second season of Buffy. People either run away or he gets stopped or something happens, but yep, not a single kill for this supposed villain. Even the shitty beast got to kill about 50 million Wolfman heart geezers. Andy Hallett is officially added to the opening credits in this episode and I keep thinking the same as everyone else. Wait, he wasn't already? Nope, Lauren has only now made a main character despite having been an active part in the team's cause since halfway through season 3. He helps the team track down Angelus with the street knowledge so he earns his spot in the main cast despite being unconscious for a good chunk of the episode. Fred and Gunn try to reignite the romance but this doesn't work. These two characters are over. They need to be for Wes's sake. My man has to make his move. I wonder if anything will possibly get in the way of that. A really solid episode which is surprising considering tonight's involvement but since Kraft and Fane are also also credited. I'll assume they did most of the work with Denite writing most of Angelus's dialogue simply because of how uncensored Angelus has been thus far when it comes to, I mean you know. If you watch my Buffy season 6 video, you can put two and two together, have a guess what they keep having him mentioned doing. Angelus takes a funny turn after drinking from Faith, as does Faith herself, revealing that she injected herself with Orpheus, a mystical drug that was being used back at that demon bar, which, when overused, causes the user to enter a deep mystical coma. Gunn helps bring Angelus back to the hotel, locking him back in the cage as Wesley brings back Faith, and once Lauren figures out what's happened and that Orpheus is involved, he loses it at Wesley. Wesley, I know what that drug does to people, especially when they supersize the dosage to make sure they really get the job done. And you damn well know it too. Cordelia attacks Connor when he won't shut up about Faith, which shows right away if any of you are paying attention that this definitely isn't Cordy, as she's part demon, remember? I don't know if Connor knew that, but the fact he doesn't realise here is outstandingly stupid. He takes out his frustrations on the rest of the team, as all hope seems lost for returning Angel's soul, and killing him seems like the best option. We need to put Angelus down. 
I don't think so. I think you need a witch. Fred calls Willow in a shock twist, unless you've seen the Buffy episode Lies My Parents Told Me, where this reveal isn't exactly a surprise after that. Since Willow is the only known person alive to return Angel's soul, Fred called her, and somehow the gang found time to spare her, even though they're fighting evil incarnate. Willow meets Cordy for the first time since season 3 of Buffy, except not really, since this isn't Cordy. I know they had regular phone calls up until Cordy's ascension, as Willow was already aware of Connor's existence, and that he's Angel's son, but I wonder if she ever suspected anything, considering there's not much hope that imposter Cordy has kept these regular calls up. Especially since Cordy initially ascended in the season 3 finale. Imposter Cordy comes very close to stabbing Willow with a hidden knife as she realises what she's arrived here to do. However, Willow figures out a way to return the soul without having to find it and leaves as Cordy's knife hits the door. Meanwhile, Faith and Angelus take a travel through Angel's memory, their mystical comas bringing them together for the torture of Angelus. We see Angel arrive in New York in the 1920s, trying to work back into society with varying degrees of success. We flash forward to the mid-70s where Angel is present in a diner that's being robbed. A fun fact, that's Eliza Dushku's brother playing the robber. The robber kills the owner and runs off, leaving Angel to be tempted by the blood. He locks the door, drinking from the owner, which begins his downward spiral, which lasts for over 20 years until he's approached by Whistler in 1996. Willow gets into a heated battle with Imposter Cordy, although Willow is oblivious to it being her, as she battles to break the jar which hosts Angel's soul. The soul is still with Cordelia, who loses the battle when Connor interrupts her, attempting to break into a barricaded room, and she has to break her spell to remain incognito. Angelus has an inner battle with Angel as the two alter egos brawl for victory. Angel wins the fight because it's his show, duh, and he convinces Faith to wake up and that life is worth living, similar to the last time these two were at odds in Season 1's Sanctuary. Connor gets into Cordelia's room. <laughs> Almost as good as the clip. Cordelia tells Connor that Willow's magic is too dangerous, a fact that Connor was already pondering for most of the episode, very anti-magic, and that he has to kill Angelus now to stop any interference with their baby being born. Connor believes this, although the two aren't linked at all, you stupid clod, and he attempts to stake Angelus. Willow, at this point, has already restored his soul and Faith arrives just in time to stop Connor from staking Angel instead. She kicks his ass, and oh my, this is also so close to the door clip, I'm not kidding. Angel wakes too and reinforces his facts, stopping Connor's attacks. In the hotel lobby, Faith bids goodbye to the team, heading back to Sunnydale with Willow to take on the first evil. Fred begins to chat Willow's ear off about books. Actually, I think it's probably funnier in Latin. You know how that is sometimes. <laughs> I'm seeing someone. They leave with hearty goodbyes as imposter Cordy reveals to the team that she's pregnant. I may want to save it for later. You know, I dug a bit more into Mir Smith's career and how she got started, and I was astounded to learn that before she became a writer for Angel starting in season 2, she was an avid writer of Buffy fanfiction. Even while she was a script coordinator for Angel's first season, she was writing Angel fanfiction online. Her first episode, Untouched, was adapted from a fanfiction she'd written which Joss Whedon liked, and that led her into working as one of the top writers on the show for seasons 2 through 4. I bring this up not just because this is her last episode of Angel, but it helps us understand her writing. I complained earlier that the two most messy episodes of the season were Long Day's Journey and Cavalry, both of which involved her. And I don't mean to demean her writing, but I think if you told me that this was written at least in part by a fanfiction writer, I'd believe the fuck out of you. She usually got given case-based episodes, and when she didn't, people would complain. And one of the biggest complaints in season 2's redefinition is the cheesy angel voiceover that plays throughout, and it was her second episode. In this episode, not only is Faith present, but so is Willow, and she grows to have a flirt festival with Fred, which, look, I mean, you all know the two real reasons for fanfiction existing. It's for characters who don't usually meet, finally meeting, and also characters fucking, and there's no easy way to say that. So in context, this scene makes perfect sense. She was bumped up to executive story editor for season 4, and mysteriously disappeared from the show altogether in season 5 when Whedon came in and shoveled things around, so my guess is that she pushed the fanfiction bar too much, she just wasn't experienced enough with intense storytelling. All of that aside, I actually enjoyed this episode, bar imposter Cordy, of course. For me, it's so intriguing to see what it's finally like inside Angel's head. The diner scene is my favourite, and it shows Angel finally succumbing to his temptations, which finally pieces together his entire timeline and how he falls apart before the start of Buffy. Willow returns to Angel finally and the circumstances for her return are incredibly competent. She's the only person to reinstall Angel and since Fred was the only person to stop and think for a second, she called her. Willow meeting Wes for the first time since his Dark Wes arc is fun to see and the two have good chemistry as showcased by their nearly 20 year long marriage together. There's another fun fact, I'm being so generous today. You know, it only just occurred to me now but remember back in season 3's Billy which ends with Wes trying to reevaluate what kind of man he is after trying to kill Fred? How obvious was that foreshadowing for his eventual betrayal? and he finally reevaluates his life and figures out what kind of man he needs to be. Willow and Faith leave when Imposter Cordy reveals her pregnancy and oh boy, the show is about to enter another dodgy spell. 
This final part of the season is entirely designed to get this season over with. On top of Muir Smith's disappearance, the writing team is at a miserable five people, being Stephen DeKnight, David Fury, Jeffrey Bell, and Crafton Fane. Two more writers will be brought in before the end of the season to try and ease the workload, but there are several contributing factors as to why this part of the season feels completely different to the rest, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. This episode is split into two stories. One involves the team dealing with Cordelia's pregnancy revealed at the end of last episode. The other, and the part that you more than likely don't care about, yet of course gets the most attention, is Gun being hired by Gwen to help rescue a kidnapped child from a Japanese business tycoon while he's hosting a party. As it turns out, this child isn't a kidnapped victim, but instead Gun is used as a distraction while Gwen steals something called Lisa, a high-tech device that will allow her to be a normal person and keep her supernatural electric abilities at bay. Gun is initially angry at being backstabbed until Gwen mentions that he's had more fun tonight than any other night in a long time. They return to Gwen's home where the device works and the two sleep together in an intimate moment where Gwen feels real human contact on her skin for the first time in her life. Meanwhile, back at the hotel, Lauren is shocked that he never detected a mystical pregnancy and he sets about organising a spell to regain his emphatic abilities so that he can read Cordelia's future. While the team researches the pregnancy, or for any sign of prophetic text to foresee it, Wes admits to Fred that he did have feelings for Lila, and that he didn't hate her, even if they were on different sides of the good fight. Angel tries to remember a passage he read as Angelus that had to do with the beast rising, but he's unable to get the translation right much to Imposter Cordy's relief. Lauren begins his ritual alone, unaware that Imposter Cordy is sneaking up on him with a knife. That is, until the team reveals themselves. Has Cordy been a bad, bad girl? So like I said, this episode is split into two parts, with Kraft and Fane focusing on Gwen and Gunn's adventure, and Jeffrey Bell forwarding the team's development. Since Muir Smith has departed the writing team, Gwen has retired as a character following this episode. She's given a happy ending, quite literally, and we never see her again, finally able to be a normal person. She does come back in the comics, where she has a relationship with Connor, and um, no thank you. Seems like they wanted to do more with her, but ended up writing her out, as the writers prepared to shift the show away from this season, reversing as much damage as possible. I spent most of this year trapped in what I can only describe as a turgid supernatural soap opera. I bet he doesn't even have a master plan. He's just making it up as he goes along. Or well, at least they're willing to admit it now. A gun and Gwen stuff is fine, even if it doesn't have much to do with anything but itself. I don't mind it, even if the twists in this little plot are a bit predictable, such as Gwen betraying Gun for her own reasons. The big twist in the main plot is the team that are all aware of Cordelia being the Beastmaster, and we'll learn more about how they know and for how long at the start of next episode. Connor continues to be Imposter Cordy's bitch, somehow still unaware that this isn't Cordelia. Wes confesses feelings for Lila, something I think we were all aware of anyway, and this explains why Wes doesn't jump to make a move on Fred instantly, because he he's grieving. Angel admits that Angelus didn't kill Lila and that it was most likely the Beast Master to Wes, which helps bring closure that he didn't know he needed. This is a surprisingly fine episode, mostly because it rests its screen time on the one-off case. The episode begins where the last left off, with the team finally catching the Beastmaster out, revealing it to be inside Cordelia's body. Her plots from the past are filled in, like Cordelia passing out alongside Angel at Manny's cell, even though she didn't have anything to drink. She was busy brutally killing Manny naked as to avoid any blood splatters on her clothes giving her away. The spell that she had the team in perform was actually to trick Lauren's sight powers rather than temporarily insulting Angelus, bargaining on the hope that Angelus would take advantage of the situation, which he did. Killing the priestesses, Lila, all of it. She gave herself away when she referred to the baby she was pregnant with as My Sweet, to which is the same name that the Beastmaster called Angelus when she was contacting him. Before they can understand what the Beastmaster's ultimate goal is and why it possessed Cordelia to do its deeds, a completely oblivious Connor appears and rescues the Beastmaster. <laughs> The team don't know where to start looking for the two once they escape. Searches turn up nothing and an Angel shoots down any suggestions to contact the powers for help considering how far they've let them go on with their intervening already. Angel instead contacts Skip, the messenger for the powers that contacted Cordelia last season when he made her part demon. Skip, however, isn't any of that and admits so, getting into a heated battle with Angel which Angel narrowly comes out on top and ripping off one of his horns. He takes him back to the hotel where the team traps him in a circle and grills him for information. Meanwhile, the Beastmaster convinces Connor to kidnap an innocent girl off of the streets for a ritual sacrifice which will bring forth the birth of her child instantly as time is running out. Connor is approached by a vision of Darla sent from the powers to stop him from bringing forth his child and killing an innocent human, that the evil within himself is not what he was destined for. He has a soul. Skip reveals to the team that everything in the show, scratch that, the canon of the entire show's universe was designed and set up to bring forth the Beastmaster. Skip never worked for the powers, instead employed by the Beastmaster to help bring it forth, setting Billy free, making Cordelia a part demon, and then a higher being. And not just that, but the team meeting, Doyle's death, Connor's impossible birth, Wes kidnapping him, Connor growing up, Cordelia becoming a higher being, Lauren's spell, and finally Cordelia sleeping with Connor has all been planned out to bring forth the Beastmaster. I smell bullshit, but we'll get to that. <laughs> 
Connor tries to free the girl, but the Beastmaster appears and reveals that it can actually see the vision of Darla that's trying to convince him to disobey it. Hmm. Connor does help the Beastmaster kill the innocent girl, which brings forth the birth much quicker than expected. Angel is left with one option to save the world. He must kill Cordelia. Skip accidentally lets slip away to find the Beastmaster using a Bashundi claw, and Angel sets off for the location. The ritual makes the city shake, which causes the circle that Skip is trapped in to be compromised, and he's set free. He tries to kill Fred, but Wes luckily shoots him through the hole in his head. Back at the unspecified location, Angel appears and fights Connor off long enough to get the chance to kill Cordelia. He waits too long, however, hesitating to take her life, which is long enough for the birth to happen, revealing a fully grown woman. Oh my god. You're beautiful. The big thing for this episode is Skip's reveal that the entire show has been a ploy to bring forth the Beastmaster and that the entire team are puppets to this scheme. I love a story with Scope. This is bullshit. There is no way that Joss Whedon and David Greenwalt had this planned from the start. I think everyone watching knows that. Considering Greenwalt left the show in season 3, leaving behind unfinished storylines to help the new showrunner get started, such as Connor's introduction and Cordelia's ascension, he did not plan for this. This episode wrecks the show rather than making it seem like something grand. Firstly, remember back in my season 3 video, I mentioned during the episode birthday that that entire episode could be brought into question following season 4. And this is what I mean. Was any of that true? The stuff about Doyle passing the visions being unprecedented and who Cordelia was really meant to be? Or was it all just a ploy from the get-go? The next thing, and I'm finally addressing it, is the circumstances surrounding Charisma Carpenter and Cordelia's mystical pregnancy. Joss Whedon initially had the idea of a beloved character going bad with Buffy's second season. Now, he wanted Angel to feel that back, where one of his dearest friends is evil and manipulative. I mentioned this before when I talked about the possibility of Doyle coming back as a big bad back in season 1, which was a genuinely considered plotline for the show. Whedon settled on Cordelia, and the entire season was meant to culminate in a massive brawl between Angel and Cordy. The thing is, Charisma Carpenter found out she was pregnant during the filming for the first few episodes of season, and due to the possibility of miscarriage during the first trimester, she kept it under wraps as it really wasn't any business of the crew's, it's her life, her child. Once enough time had passed, Carpenter attempted to tell Whedon about her pregnancy, however he refused to answer her calls, meaning that by the time they got a hold of him and told Whedon about her pregnancy, he reportedly flipped the fuck out. His vision for season 4 could no longer be, as now they had to incorporate Carpenter's real life pregnancy into the plot of the season, when production was already underway. Whedon continued to call Carpenter fat while she was pregnant to her face, giving her long and arduous work hours that began to affect her physically, which explains why Carpenter's performance is up and down through the season. And then finally, Whedon fired her from the show following the conclusion of the fourth season. Cordelia enters a coma following the mystical birth in this episode, and the character stays that way. I know I've said before that I wanted to make the series to celebrate my love for both shows, and one of the very first things I said in my season 1 Buffy video was that I didn't want to talk about the drawbacks of what Whedon did, choosing to admire not just his work, but the writing of the show as an art form all around. This behind the scenes situation is pivotal in understanding why the season took such a fucking nosedive, and why Cordelia's character, who had been a fan favourite and whose development up to the conclusion of season 3 had been stellar, lost her appeal. Regardless of the situation and who said what, for Whedon to take out his frustrations with Carpenter out on her in that form is disgusting, and effectively assassinating her character because of things that were going on outside of the show is childish. I like to think that had David Greenwald still been active on Angel during this time, he wouldn't have stood for such outrageous behaviour from Whedon or the ridiculous plot of an evil Cordelia. The pregnancy storyline was ushered in, so came the romance with Connor alongside it, and the seeds were planted in the seventh episode, Apocalypse Nowish. Gina Torres is brought in to act as a substitute villain for the next four episodes, and makes her first appearance at the conclusion of this episode. Connor continues to be quite annoying when he rescues the Beastmaster, of course he's unaware it isn't Cordelia, but still, read the room, man. He shares a scene with Darla, who is actually the power's vain attempt to try and foil the Beastmaster's plan, which doesn't work. Vincent Carthizer is absolutely superb in this scene. You can just tell he would go on to be a great actor, because when you can make the absolute best out of crap writing, there's something there. The Beastmaster being able to see Darla means that there is some sort of link between the two, but what that is we'll have to wait until the next episode when we learn a bit more about who the Beastmaster really is. This episode begins the final arc of the season, which I'll call the Jasmine arc, for reasons that will make themselves known very shortly. For a pretty serious season, this final arc does the best job it can do to shift the show's tone once again into a far more comedic one, and while this isn't all comedy in this arc, it's a jarring change from what we had just had for 17 episodes. The mysterious woman, which is the form of the Beastmaster, brought forth into the world after being birthed from Cordelia, affects Angel and Connor in the weirdest way. They fall completely head over heels for her, praising her like some god. They head to the team who tried to tell them it's a love spell, until they all fall victim to the love spell too. The woman 
woman who begins to tell them of her origin and that she was once a member of the powers that be but couldn't stand by idly and watch the human race massacre each other. So she's here to bring peace to the world against the powers wishes. So she's gone rogue pretty much. She explains something that I mentioned last season and that's the life that Angel won back in season 2's The Trail was the life that brought Connor forth to be her father. She wants to start a war against evil and the team gets to work ridding Los Angeles of every single vampire and demon they can. The woman can't work out what her name should be considering she doesn't have one and asks Fred for help although she's suddenly cut by a vampire. The fight leads outside to a group of diners where the vampire who attacked the woman collapses onto another man. The woman's presence mesmerises a group of people as the vampire is staked. However that man I just mentioned begins calling her a monster and attempts to kill her. Angel deals with him as does the woman and they head back to the hotel. The woman observes the growing jasmine in the garden while sharing a conversation with Angel where he swears not to let her be hurt again. Fred offers to clean the woman's shirt as penance for letting her get cut. While the rest of the team continue killing, Fred continues trying and trying to get the blood out of the shirt but ends up buying a new one instead. She goes to explain to the woman but instead of seeing Gina Torres... The others clamber in at the first noise of trouble and Fred plays off her sudden jolt back to reality as she excuses herself in the room, the love spell having been worn off. Fred heads to the hospital where she talks to the man from the crowd who's been placed in a psych ward bound to his bed. She tells him how she saw the woman for what she really is and the man reveals that his face has been horribly disfigured since the woman touched him. He tries to convince Fred that she's been called and that she has to stop it. This scares her and she heads back to the crowded hotel where many have flocked to see the woman and Fred confesses to Wesley the truth about where she was and why. Wesley tells Fred he believes her before he spreads the words to the others in a chilling scene where Fred realizes realizes just how alone she is in this lobby full of people. Fred panics and attempts to shoot the woman when she appears as Angel and Connor spring into action. She takes on hostage in order to escape out the door. The woman tells the rest of the team that Fred is now evil and against their cause, which means they'll have to kill her like they do every other demon. The woman is very hesitant to do this however, instead telling them that they should try and reason with Fred, help her with whatever's worrying her. Fred has breakfast at a local diner when suddenly the morning show on the TV introduces a woman named Jasmine, who is the woman under her new name and suddenly her thrall begins to take over all passers-by and whoever may be watching at home. Fred walks down the street, alone. So here we have our big bad. Jasmine, a power that was dedicated to her own cause of bringing world peace. This seems too good to be true, and sure enough, something is definitely up when both the man and Fred inexplicably see Jasmine as a horrible maggot creature. We will get answers soon, but it all started when Jasmine got cut at the bowling alley. Cordelia, like I mentioned before, now takes a complete backseat from the plot, now in a mystical coma following Jasmine's birth. Fred shares a brief scene with her when she has no one else to turn to, as Cordy is now placed as a sort of attraction to the hotel, being the one who birthed the bringer of peace. There's not much else I can say about this episode other than watching the team go back and forth from ridiculously over the top worshippers to genuinely unnerving and vicious killers. My favourite scene is the hotel scene, where Fred slowly begins to realise that the team don't believe her when it comes to seeing Jasmine in her true form. I love the bit at the end where Fred wanders into the streets of LA, the only person aware of who Jasmine really is and that isn't locked in a hospital psych ward. It feels like an episode of the Twilight Zone or something and that fact will be expanded upon in the next episode. Good watch, I'm liking this new tone change already. As Jasmine continues expanding her control on the people of Los Angeles, whisking some followers away to her room for unknown reasons, Fred tries to evade the team's attempts to capture her, which she does. She heads to a local bookstore where the owner, a once conspiracy theory madman, chats happily to Fred about mind control, which Fred suspects Jasmine is guilty of. The owner misinterprets this as Fred wishing to send Jasmine's love to the government and shows her a book he has on the subject, scaring Fred when he unveils a gun temporarily. Fred tries to book a hotel room, however Jasmine's power grows and with the team's help, she is able to see from the eyes of every one of her followers, finding Fred's location in no time, and now all of her followers know the identity of Fred and that Jasmine wants to see her. Fred manages to escape Jasmine again, wandering in the wilderness of the highways where a passing car looks to have spotted her stopping in its tracks. Fred goes off-road, coming across a small demon in a cave. The two are hostile towards each other until Fred learns that the demon doesn't worship Jasmine either, hiding in this cave until it all blows over or else he'll probably get killed. He assures Fred he doesn't eat people until his stash of hands is uncovered and Fred kills him. Fred returns to the bookstore, allowing herself to be found by Jasmine who shows up with Angel and Connor by her side. Jasmine rewards the owner of the store by telling him the truth about JFK's assassination. There was no second gun. Gunman. Oswald acted alone. Oh my god! Fred apologises to Angel before grabbing the loaded gun from the owner's desk and shooting Angel through Jasmine, allowing their blood to mix. And when Angel looks at Jasmine, he sees Maggot Face. The key is Jasmine's blood, which the man got on him from the vampire and Fred got on her when she was cleaning the shirt. Angel and Fred flee as Jasmine instructs the owner to burn the store to the ground when she finds her blood is all over the floor to avoid anyone else losing their love. Angel and Fred share their mutual grieving over Jasmine's love, which provided them with the comfort that everything was going to be alright. However, reality hits them again and they're chased by citizens under Jasmine's thrall, with the band instructions 
instructions of Killing Friend and Angel on site. The two come up with a plan that if Jasmine's blood is the key to returning people to normal, perhaps Cordelia's blood will work too, considering she's the mother. They break into the hotel and Lauren bumps into them, who they turn back and find Cordelia's blood works. Apparently better than Jasmine's own blood, because unlike Fred and Angel, he doesn't actually need to see Jasmine as maggot face to have the spell be broken. Lauren puts a face on to lead Wes and gun up to the room to get turned back to, and Angel is defiant that he won't leave without Connor. Jasmine, meanwhile, is healing her bullet wound by making more green lights appear when people are in the room. Where are those people? I ate them. She ate them then. Wesley agrees to go and get Connor. I'll get him. I've kidnapped him before. Underrated line. He does so and they turn Connor back. They're here! Come quick, they're here! Oh, for fuck's sake, door this motherfucker. <laughs> This episode has many different parts to it, some of which come and go without much explanation. Like, the hell was up with the finger-eating demon, and why was he here for like 10 minutes with so many lines to get killed off and never brought up again? The bulk of the episode is Fred-centric, with glimpses of the team and Jasmine sprinkled in. I didn't mention the rope and mic night, which has many great moments, including a rendition of Barry Manilow's Mandy with the words changed accordingly. So Jasmine, and you came and you gave without taking. We should be doing this every night. And we'll keep you forever, oh Jasmine. This part of the season feels so much more consistent than the last three quarters, it's very jarring. Very jarring. But the point of the episode is to get the team back together again, although Cordelia's in a coma and Connor's been an annoying prick, so the majority of the team. I like this episode, even for its flaws, considering what we've come from to get here. This really isn't too bad, to be honest. A new writer to the show, Ben Edlund, is brought in to provide a new fresh take on the team to help transition into Season 5, which Edlund will play a big role in shaping. His only contribution to Season 4 is quite contained, following the team in the sewers after escaping from the hotel. Thanks to Connor, the worshippers are on their asses and Angel rushes to shut the door. No, nah, wait a minute, that's not how that's supposed to go. Much better. You better still be laughing at that door, but I've worked hard on this video. They escape, fail to avoid Jasmine's worshippers, and abandon the car to go underground, where Angel tells the team defiantly to forget about Cordelia. Do it. Forget about her. We all have to now. We don't have a choice. He's pretty much telling the viewer that, in hopes you don't realise that they really balls that character up. They're soon found by a group of kids who hid underground when the sun disappeared and are somehow unaware that that part of the season ended like six episodes ago and also that Jasmine is a thing. They head out to take on Jasmine together, agreeing to team up until they're attacked by a zealot demon, which kidnaps Wesley, and after seeing Angel's vampire face, one of the kids runs off to the surface where Gunn and Fred are sent after him to prevent him from coming across Jasmine as he'll lead her right to them. The zealot is planning a sacrificial ritual to show his love for Jasmine, hailing from a world that Jasmine ruled over first, and he insists that once she is done with air, Earth, she will return to his world. We loved her first. Wesley prods the zealot for information as he disembowels a vampire who lets slip to Wes that Jasmine has a real name, and that if this name were to be spoken aloud, it would destroy Jasmine's thrall completely. He's unable to learn the name though as the zealot begins to get violent with Wes until Angel shows up and kills it. Gunn and Fred travel through the sewers to find the kid. Or it could just be rats. Now, what'd you have to go and say that for? Damn! Where they also share a conversation about killing Seidel, and Fred admits that killing him is the wrong thing to do and that she's been paying the price for it ever since as it's haunted her. Well, I don't know about you, but I'd take that over being a shell any day. <coughs> they reach the surface and find the kid, who they bring back to the sewer. <laughs> Buddy, I see you. Love how creepy that reveal is. This leads Connor, who brings with him the fucking National Guard, right to the team, who attempt to find Angel and Wes. Those two are busy fawning over a talisman that the zealot used to bring itself into this dimension, and that the way to find out Jasmine's true name must be in their dimension. Of course it's not Earth, so there'll be no oxygen, so Angel is the only one that has to go through the portal. Angel senses Connor and helps the rest of the team get to where Wes is, and Angel steps through the portal. The battle between the team and the National Guard commences as Jasmine begins to feel the pain of every single member of her worshippers laughing maniacally. Angel steps through the other side of the portal into the zealot's world, where he is greeted by many different zealots. This is a weird episode, which hides the fact that it's mainly used for lore expansion, introducing the zealots, explaining more about Jasmine's past, with a mostly standalone adventure surrounding the team in the sewers. And we do get scenes with Connor and Jasmine, where Jasmine absorbs Connor's pain, like she's done with so many other worshippers, and that's why she gets off on it at the end of the episode, despite the fact she's not in the battle at all. We do get the big CGI scene, and okay, it doesn't look great, but oh, come on, this is ambitious. That's the word I would use to describe season four. Ambitious. Doesn't mean it worked out, but they tried to create a unique story that ties the whole thing together with many different dimensions, creatures, 
adventurous villains and twists to keep you on the edge of your seat. Here, it works. Unlike earlier in the season, ignore that voice crack. The kids are a cool perspective to push on the team. We don't see many kids in Angel besides Connor, so having them be completely freaked out and secluded from the world is entirely plausible. Kids might do that if they were really truly scared. I like this episode, it does its job and sets up for the grand finale, even though there's two episodes left. The team are captured by the National Guard, and Jasmine instructs that they be brought to her at the hotel. She begins to tell them about her previous attempts at world peace, including the Zealot's world, which failed since there was no easy way to spread her love compared to Earth. She's planning to beam herself around the entire world through satellite TV, which is being set up in the lobby of the hotel as she speaks to the team. Gunn tries to get Connor to see Jasmine as maggot face. I know what she looks like. She's beautiful. I really want to do another door. I really fucking want to, but I've done too many. Turns out Connor has always seen Jasmine as maggot face, and because he grew up in Kortoth, he has no real gauge for what is considered beautiful and what's not, like us. I'll just forget about all of the women he's met that he's also found beautiful. Angel makes his way to a temple where Jasmine's true name lies, known only to one demon who will only reveal the name in his final breath. Connor finds Jasmine getting ready to eat a big group of people where he asks what happened to Cordelia's body and where it was moved to. Jasmine refuses to tell Connor, only that she's right where she wants her to be. Connor uses his tracking ability to find Cordy's scent, which leads him to a church. He gets past the guards and has a great monologue to Cordelia's comatose body where he reveals that Jasmine's spell never worked on him. He never felt the effects of it and he knows it's a lie. He just prefers that lie to all the others that his life has been built around. Jasmine begins her live broadcast which begins to work until Angel shows up through a portal with the severed head of the demon, opening its own mouth to reveal Jasmine's true name, breaking her spell. Ellie breaks into chaos as the pain and suffering they once felt has all returned, and there are riots aplenty. Jasmine catches up with Angel and the two share a fantastic back and forth about who is right and who is wrong. Angel fought for choice, and that everyone on Earth should be free of her slavery and able to live their own lives. Jasmine, although she ate people, in her own words, she ate thousands to save billions. Jasmine did want world peace, sick of all the evil and fighting, providing a paradise to the human race. It's a great moral dilemma to throw at the viewer. Obviously free will is the no-brainer, but Angel's in the business of saving lives, and he's probably lost more now in stopping Jasmine than he would have if he didn't. Jasmine, in a last-ditch attempt, plans to wipe out the human race as revenge for what Angel's done, since he has a role in the apocalypse. She wants to make it come true that he helped make it happen by stopping her. Connor shows up before she can do anything and tells Jasmine that he still loves her after everything that's happened. Connor runs off after finishing off the week Jasmine and Angel returns to the hotel and he tells the team that he's really worried about Connor, almost like he's lost hope, giving up on the world. I think he's gonna do something, you know, he might- End world peace? Well, you already took care of that. <laughs> That's a fucking twist. So, effectively this episode is the finale to the season, and that the big bad is killed, with the next episode acting as an epilogue of sorts, foreshadowing the next season ahead. Think back to season 4 of Buffy, which I seem to be drawing a lot of comparisons to, aren't I? Firstly, Gina Torres is superb as Jasmine, providing both a warm and unsettling performance. Although she wasn't initially planned for the show, I couldn't imagine this season without her. The Jasmine arc is by far the most consistent part of the season, and these episodes have a fitting flow into each other. Connor kills Jasmine, ending the lie he deemed the most appealing, which probably is why Angel is so worried about him going off the deep end. The big part of the episode that I left out was what the team gets up to after Jasmine imprisons him in the cage in the basement. They plan an entire attack on her, which basically amounts to nothing as by the time they break out, which involves gun kicking the door for a long period of time, they find the aftermath of Jasmine's true name. They do, however, run into Lila, who makes a shocking return to the show after her death in Cavalry. Why and how is she here? Well, we'll find out next episode, but it's a great ending to leave us on. I mentioned the moral dilemma earlier in the plot summary, and it plays into that while Lila's here. I'm just about ready to wrap this season up, I don't know about you. Tim Minear returns after taking a reduced role from the writing following season 3 to write his only contribution to this season. You know things are bad when they have to bring in a writer who's had no involvement with the season to effectively introduce all the new things that season 5 will bring, of which Tim Minear will have nothing to do with anyway, since he doesn't write for the show anymore. I really wish I could hear that desperate phone call for help. Lila offers the team a reward for ending world peace, and that's full control of the LA branch of Wolfram and Hart, but how is she here? Well, her contract with Wolfram and Hart lasts long after her death, which provides a loophole that allows her to continue being in the show after she's killed, except this is her last appearance because we need a vastly inferior replacement character next season, of course. The team are understandably sceptical to accept this considering Wolf and Hart goes against everything they stand for, but Lila insists that they won't hold control and the team are free to use their offices for the same fight against evil that they are pursuing now. A limo is waiting outside to take whoever wants to go and won't leave until morning. In other news, Connor is beating people up. Who saw that coming? He stops a cop from killing himself after Jasmine's downfall, but when he finds out that the guy has a family and he was willing to end his life, he fucking beats the shit out of him, and I don't know what they were going for with this scene, but it's hilariously funny. Angel heads out to find Connor while the others head to bed. During the night, Fred attempts to sneak her way to the limo, running into Wesley, and they run into Gunn, and they run into Angel, all keen yet cautious to see what Wolfman Hunter are really offering. 
So it's an evil limo, I get that, but does that mean we don't restock the cherries? <laughs> At W and H, each member of the team is allocated a guide to show them around their departments and what they have to offer. Lauren goes to the entertainment department, meeting his favourite pop idols. Fred is with a young dorky scientist named Knox, and I'll just pretend I didn't just see this guy in a Buffy episode earlier this season. She would take control of a state-of-the-art lab and equipment to do with whatever she pleases. Wesley's taking in the books, of which there aren't many. Well, these are actually templates for an entire archive of research material, all of which could be accessed with a whisper. He's impressed, but decides to explore elsewhere by knocking his guide out. Gunn is taken to the white room, where he meets his true guide, a panther, the new conduit to the senior partners, and Gunn seems to have been picked to be some sort of link between the senior partners and the team. Finally, Angel is shown to a potential office by Lila, showing that the windows are rayproof and that he has a big HD TV all to himself. She even teases Angel with something related to the Sunnydale apocalypse, an amulet which Buffy will need to prevent the said apocalypse, however he believes that Buffy can handle herself. Angel still isn't convinced, but as he turns to leave, a news report comes on the TV about Connor, who's decided to hold a sports store hostage alongside several pedestrians and a comatose Cordelia, all strapped with bombs. <laughs> Before leaving, Angel seems to begin to make his own offer with Lila. Wesley, meanwhile, heads down to fill some records where he attempts to torch Lila's contract, but that doesn't work as the fell just returns to where it was after every destruction. She's stuck with Wolfman Hunt, and there's nothing either of them can do about it. Angel heads to the sports store, quickly learning that Connor has lost all rhyme or reason and is acting irrationally. How the fuck did he even make these bombs? Yet another thing Holtz showed him in a hell dimension where none of these ingredients existed? I'll just say he googled it. Angel promises to Connor that he will make things better and all his problems will go away, but Connor isn't having it. Angel manages to stop Connor from setting off the bomb attached to Cordelia by stabbing him in the leg. I really do love you, Connor. So what are you gonna do about it? Prove it. At Wolfman Hart, the team meet back up in the lobby and all agree that what they've been offered is intriguing, and they're tempted to accept. Angel shows up and tells them all that he's accepted the offer already, asking Lila if he can see Connor just one last time. Lila is reluctant but gives in, handing him the envelope containing the amulet. Connor. Angel watches on as his son has been given a new life, with no memory of Angel or Kototh. Instead, he has a loving family, an education, a future. To family. To family. And this is where our season ends. This episode acts more like a pitch to the network as to why they shouldn't be cancelled after a disaster of a fourth season. It teases a lot of what season 5 will have to offer, what each member of the team has at their fingertips, the battle they'll face working Wolfram and Hart, and no Connor, oh give me the DVD already, Jesus Christ! Yes, that's the big thing that happens here. Angel makes a deal with Wolfman Hart to give Connor a whole new life and he will be the only person to remember that he even existed. While the team no longer maintains the memory, a drastic retcon to try and salvage any semblance of a consistent fifth season. This will cause a few questionable inconsistencies with characters next season, especially with Wesley. Since Connor no longer existed, what made West part ways with the team and become Dark Wesley? Because we will learn that this did still happen. How did Cordy give birth to Jasmine if Connor didn't? Well, you know. Turns out that whole feather will kill the sun prophecy wasn't a fluke after all. Are we sure Sajan wasn't actually a prophet? Lila makes her final appearance here, and this is a fine exit, I suppose. Her initial death was played too much for shock value in my opinion, but the following episode and this one provide a conclusive feeling that she's still out there in the afterlife, working for Wolfman Hart, the side she picked. Lorne takes a poor downturn this season, allocated almost no plotlines after his rescue from Vegas. It's sad because he's such a lovable character, and he's finally promoted to main cast, but he just seems to work in the background all season. The time when he has the most impact is during the Jasmine arc, when he leads Wes and Gunn to the team. That's it. That's the most impact he made to any story progression in the season. Come on. We don't even see him interact with his guide this episode, besides being introduced and then meeting up with the team again. Gunn continues to go up and down. His relationship with Fred ends abruptly and messily, which leads him to being downright unlikable for a major chunk of the season. However, once he's given time to heal, his friendship with Wes is now recovered, which was a banter I'd sorely missed, so I'm glad it's back in some form. Gunn was demoted to being the muscle this season and acting entirely as a powerhouse for the team. The writers even make fun of this in this episode, showing off a security section where he complains that Wolfman Hart also only see him as the muscle, until of course it's revealed that they have much bigger plans for him. It's nice to see that they actually have a plan for Gunn, who spent nearly two full seasons deciding whether or not he wanted to stay with the team or go back to his old crew. Something new, something new. Fred gets a taste for a lot of new things this season, including being a leader and parent while Angel is away, learning to lean on someone when she needs help, learning to be alone again after Gunn and her break. It's all hardened her, and she's a well-built character, a far cry from the insane and rambling girl they found in Pylea. They keep leaning on the love triangle between her Gunn and Wes, which was established last season, but by around the halfway point and once her and Gunner over, we move on thankfully. I know I moan about love triangle plotlines a lot simply because I think it's such an overused storyline for TV shows, however I don't mind this one. It served the purpose for a character to develop. 
and that was Wesley. For example, the original love triangle for Buffy was between Xander Willow and Buffy, and that was added in simply for romantic flair between characters that didn't need it. But it was the first season, so I let that one slide, as they were still working things out. Rayleigh Buffy Spike was poor due to it being used as a way to get Rayleigh out of Buffy, so Buffy and Spike could have a will they won't they for nearly a full season. Grew Cordy Angel? That was simply to pad out Cordy and Angel from happening until the end of the season. Fred Gunn Wesley helped develop Wes into the character we know him as now, and also helped Fred Harden and Gunn. Well, I'm still working on that one, and I think the writers are too. Just wait till next season. Speaking of Wesley, this is another Far Cry character. Gone of the glasses, in come the leather jackets and jeans. He's casual, he's cruel, and he's fucking cool. Seriously, if you had told me this guy. <laughs> this guy. Right? This guy. <laughs> was going to be one of the most brutal and on the edge of evil characters in just a few seasons, I would have called you mad. His relationship with Lila is executed brilliantly, with top performances from both Denisov and Romanov to show a chemistry we haven't seen done since Angel and Darla in season 2, and dare I say this is written better despite being in the biggest mess of a season. With Angel and Darla, there were twists and turns, however the back and forth were about what you expected, but with Wes and Lila, I mean you didn't know what Wes was going to do or say next, considering where he was at that time and what he threw away. The fact that he reunited with the team was due to Lila's help, intentionally or not, with the red herring and slouching toward Bethlehem, which led to watching Fred's speech in Supersymmetry, helping with Lauren Spell and Spin the Bottle, and finally his complete reconnection in Apocalypse Nourish. Fantastic season for this character. The same can't be said for Cordelia, or what isn't actually Cordelia. The last we see of her is in The House Always Wins, when she helps Angel break his curse by manipulating the slot machine. Everything after isn't a continuation of a character. It's an illusion that they actually did anything with her. She slips into a coma and inside out, and stays that way for the rest of the season. This is sadly the end of her seven year reign as a main character, and no matter what they may attempt to do with our next season to fix this, they won't. They can't fix this. This was a purposeful sabotage of character. An assassination. And I'm outraged. I just, I just don't have any energy left in me to convey this point right now, and I think you will understand. Connor was a character that was reportedly created by Joss Whedon and Tim Minear with assistance from David Greenwald. Now considering two of those guys had almost nothing to do with this season, Connor was at odds with the writing team from day one. Already they were writing him out of the way so the team could do their own thing, and by the time they wanted him working with the team, it was too late. This character was given nothing to love about, unlike every other character in the show. You know, no funny lines, dorky moments, or humanising features besides not wanting kids killed. He develops an unhealthy obsession with Cordelia, so for all of you saying Wes's obsession with Fred was out of line, imagine if he strapped a bomb to her and was shouting the glory glory hallelujah. I'll leave him by letting you have a brief watch of this screen test that was done for Vincent Carthizer as Connor before the character was properly introduced, where Connor wasn't actually Angel's son, but instead he had temporary custody of a teenager who had his own life and couldn't care less about the fight against evil or the vampires were real, just to show you what we could have had. It's career day at school next week. I thought maybe you could come in and tell everyone how great it is to be a vampire. You're not going out. What? Why not? Cordelia had a vision. Something's up. That's not my problem. Well, you know, it is if it kills you. <sighs> this is so unfair. Angel has one interesting season this time around. Beginning by being rescued from the bottom of the ocean, fighting with his son and fake Cordy for about 8 episodes before becoming Angelus. He returns in Orpheus and attempts to do what's right before being brainwashed only 2 episodes later. You know what, come to think of it, they really didn't do an awful lot with the main character this season, did they? They gave you the illusion they did by having the whole Angelus arc, but really this did nothing to further Angel. The only thing that really did develop him was in the last episode when he has to kill Connor to start a new life for him. I'm interested to see where that, plus working with the enemy, will take him next season, but for this season, he's a right off. Season 4 of Angel is quite the roller coaster. It has its moments, but due to everything surrounding Cordelia, Connor, and Cordelia and Connor completely ruin this from being the great thrilling spectacle they want it to be. I really like some aspects of this. The Faith and Jasmine arcs are fun in my personal season highlights. To be honest, this feels like four seasons in one. Seriously, first there was Cordelia being lost, then there was the Beast, then Angelus, then Faith was here for a while, then we segued into Jasmine, ending with the team joining Wolfram and Hart, and all the while Gwen was hanging around in the back. It's just weird and feels more like a bizarre fan fiction as opposed to an actual season they really made. My favourite episode has to be Spin the Ball. It's the one episode where nothing is fucked up, and it's a bit of fun before things start to stink. My least favourite episode is Long Day's Journey. It's just a mess. Like I mentioned before, structured about as solid as a cup of coffee of boot. It's a plot episode that they treat as a segue between the Beast and Angelus. I will say, I was surprised that I didn't hate the season nearly as much as I thought I was going to on this critical revisit, and it's quite an ambitious story to tell, but we'll soon come to learn that instead of making it up as you go along, planning it all out can really pay off, as after the conclusion of Buffy and cancellation of Firefly, Joss Whedon returned to the project full time, bringing in a few new and talented writers to assist in creating a show that you can confidently put your faith in to be entertained. Let's go out with a bang. Time for the final season.